Okay, good afternoon or evening everyone. Today in this session I'm going to be talking about the process we've undertaken to develop a toolkit to help organisations monitor and evaluate their reintegration work. In particular, I'm going to be discussing one element of the data gathering that has taken place to inform the development of the toolkit, and that's a consultation we coordinated with 89 children and young people living in seven different countries. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to be discussing in this session, I'm going to start by providing a bit of background about my work and this particular project. I'll describe the process that we went through to organise the consultation and the findings of the consultation. And then I'm going to finish by sharing details of how the process has led to changes within the organisations that took part and how the learning has been fed into the toolkit. And I'll also share with you some key learning points to take away. OK, so to give you some background, my role at the centre is funded by the Oak Foundation and I've been working on a project since the end of 2009 that aims to develop learning and knowledge transfer around the recovery and reintegration of children affected by sexual exploitation and related trafficking globally. And on the screen, you can just see the website address for Home, the Child Recovery and Reintegration Network, which is a network that I coordinate as part of the bigger project. And you can find more information about the work on there. So as part of this bigger project on recovery and reintegration, in October last year, I organised a workshop on monitoring, evaluation and reintegration. The meeting brought together representatives from some of the key agencies working on this in this field, including UNICEF, Save the Children, Every Child and IOM. At the end of the workshop, there was consensus from the group that a toolkit to help organisations monitor and evaluate reintegration work would be useful and that it would make sense to look at reintegration across different groups of children. So not just those affected by sexual exploitation and trafficking, but also children who are reintegrated into families and communities following time on the streets or following other circumstances that have led them to be separated from their family. So following the workshop, we devised a project plan and set up a steering group made up of some of the organisations that were represented at the meeting. So why did we decide that a toolkit would be useful? Well, we know that there's a lack of evaluation data when it comes to support programmes for children and young people, and that it makes it difficult to understand what works, why and for whom. So we know that as a sector, we need to get better at monitoring and evaluating programmes so that we can learn and improve services. We also know that reintegration programmes are really complex and they often involve a number of stakeholders. And as the aim is to improve the overall well-being of the child, it means that work cuts across different sectors. So that includes working with education, on livelihood work, health, legal and housing support, as well as other forms of support aimed at the family and community. So it can be really tricky to decide what changes to measure and what data to collect. And although there's lots of really great monitoring and evaluation guides out there, they don't always give practical information, particularly around how to involve children and young people in data collection in an appropriate, sensitive and safe way. So we wanted to develop a toolkit that would help organisations to monitor and evaluate their reintegration work by providing them with practical suggestions of what they should be assessing and examples and tools of how to do that. So as part of the development of the toolkit, we decided we would organise a consultation with children and young people who had experience of support and reintegration programmes with the hope that, they'd would that this would help inform and shape the toolkit. So we began by putting out a call for interest, asking organisations if they would be interested in getting involved and organising a consultation with the young people they'd previously supported. A number of organisations came forward to this call, and following this, we spoke with them in detail about the process, the support available, and the logistics around organising a workshop. And from this, we selected a number of partner organisations to work with us. I then worked with an independent consultant on children's participation, Helen Beach, to develop the guidance and session plans for the consultation, along with an ethical strategy. Once we developed these tools, Retrack, an organisation working with street connected children in Africa, were approached and they kindly agreed to pilot the guidance material with, with young people that they worked with in two settings in Uganda and Ethiopia. Based on the feedback from the pilot, the guidelines were revised and Helen carried out virtual training with all the partner organisations, talking them through the different consultation activities step by step, discussing any issues or queries they had, 
and also discussing the ethical strategy and risk assessment for the consultations. And following that training, the consultations were held by nine partner organisations in June and July this year. And these partner organisations then reported the results to us. So here were the partner organisations that were involved, who all did a fantastic job facilitating the discussions with children and young people. And you can see from the table on the screen that consultations took place in East and West Africa or in Eastern Europe. Now, we had hoped to get a more kind of diverse geographical mix, but this was really out of our control as we had to work with those organisations who were prepared to work with us, interested and also could carry out the consultation in a very specific time period. But you can see that we managed to get a range of age groups involved in the consultations and also a mixture of, of boys and girls. So the circumstances of the children and young people, all of the children who took part had been supported by the partner organisations and were at the time of the consultation either, either living with their family, living with friends, living independently or living with foster carers although two of the young people were still being supported by the organisations. And it's also important to say that not all the children had experienced trafficking, as we wanted to learn about reintegration experiences across different populations. And therefore, within the sample, children had varied experiences of separation and reintegration. So some had been street connected, others had experienced sexual exploitation and trafficking. Some were trafficked into labour exploitation, specifically the fishing industry in the case of Ghana, and others had been separated or abandoned due to a multitude of reasons. Now, some of the young people had been living back with their families or living in new situations for up to five years, and others had only been back for about three months, so there was a range of experiences there. It's also important, I think, to note at this stage that this isn't a representative sample of all reintegrated children, as the children were selected by the partner organisations, they weren't randomly selected. So that's just something to keep in mind as we go through. OK, so what did we want the consultations to tell us? Well, the first thing we wanted to know was what children and young people felt were the most significant changes that happened to them since coming into contact with the support organisation. And why did we want to know this? So that we could understand all the different areas of a child's life where they experience change during this period of reintegration. So we wanted to know, for example, if health was an issue for young people, or school, or family relationships, or friends. We wanted to build up a good picture of all these different areas that we needed to consider when developing a monitoring and evaluation framework. So to find out about these changes, children and young people were asked to make river of life drawings. And you can probably see on the picture on the screen that these drawings allowed young people to draw the key events and people in their lives from the point of time in which they joined the support organisation to where they were today. So this involves drawing key people in their lives, key events, key activities, um, any, any kind of activity or event that made a difference to them. And children were then asked if they would like to share their stories with the group of other young people and were then asked to select the most significant or the biggest change from their story that they had experienced. And during the stories, the children and young people spoke about many common themes and changes in their lives that had been brought about through the support they received from the partner organisations. And I should say that all the names being used are the names that the children actually came up with for themselves, so they're not their real names, as you can probably tell as we go through. So first of all, children and young people talked about their basic needs being met by the partner organisation. They talked about getting food and medical attention and having a roof over their heads. So for example, on the screen there is a quote from Romeo in Uganda, who talks about how life was very hard on the street, but when he came to the, the shelter, to the drop-in centre, he was able to eat, he had somewhere to sleep and could get medical care. And similarly, a young boy from Ghana talked about now having good food to eat, whereas before he didn't have that. And it wasn't all about shelter either, it was also about safety. So some children and young people, particularly those ones who have been trafficked, talked about having a safe place to stay. So here Anna from Albania talks about the biggest change for her was having somewhere safe for her and her daughter to, to stay. 
Some children also talked about improvements that had been made to their homes from the partner organisations and that they were really happy about these changes when they went home. And this included things like the, the roofs on the houses being fixed, the households getting toilets or fridges or other material assistance. So here Tabby from Kenya talks about the fact that when she went home uh, she found the drainage system had been cleaned and that she now had a bed and a mattress so she didn't have to sleep on the floor any longer. Many of the young people also talked about going to school and doing well at school. Many of them talked about learning to read and write, which for them was the most significant change that had happened during their period of support. So here two boys from Ghana and Albania talked about going to school and the fact that it's helped them a lot and that they can now read and write. Some young people also talked about gaining confidence and feeling better about themselves since coming into contact with a partner organisation. So here two girls from Albania are talking about how they're very proud of themselves now. So one of them now has a job, um, she's, she's graduated and she's living her dream, so she's proud of where she is in life. And another young girl talks about the fact that she's happy and ready to face, to face everything. So this kind of inner strength that's come from the support organisation supporting these young people um, to grow and develop. Many of the young people also talked about how they felt their behaviour had changed and that often this was due to interactions with staff who helped them to understand what was appropriate behaviour and what was inappropriate behaviour. So they felt they were stronger and able to avoid peer pressure, they were more disciplined and they now respected other people including elders and their parents. And some also talked about changes in terms of no longer stealing or getting into fights. So here are two quotes from, from two boys in Uganda and you can see that uh, they talk about respecting their parents now um, and they used to steal but now they don't. And then Frank talks about the fact that he's no longer fighting with peers but he's starting to get on better with other people. So these are the kind of changes that, that a lot of the young people spoke about. In terms of skills, young people also talked about the skills that they'd learnt and this covered lots of different areas. So included things like learning um, the national language or learning independent skills that allowed them to take care of themselves and take care of others. So here Anna from Albania is talking about how she's learned to take care of her daughter, um, so parenting skills, but also how she's learned to not let others hurt her anymore. Susan, a younger girl from Kenya, has talked about how she's learned um, from the, the support program not to um, how to say no to boys, how to cook food, um, hygiene, and also about choosing good friends and, and relation, healthy relationships. The older young people also talked a lot about being able to earn money, um, getting vocational skills and being able to support themselves or their families. So here Lollipop from Uganda talks about the fact that um, she saved enough money after leaving the care of the support organisation and set up her own salon and that life is much easier now that she can take care of her basic needs and continue um, with her life. Similarly, um, a younger boy from Ethiopia here talks about the fact that the money that he got from the organisation, he was able to buy a bicycle, which he rents and makes money that way, but also that he was able to buy an ox and will sell that at a later stage um, and get some, some good money for that. So the, having these income streams was very important for many young people who had to take care of their than themselves or they had to pay for their schooling or take care of siblings or family members. And lastly, a lot of young people talked about relationships and the changes in the relationships. Um, they spoke about changes in terms of strengthening the relationships with parents or, or other family members. So here Sarah from Albania is talking about how the organisation helped in the mediation between herself and her family and that she's now able to talk to her father after a long period of, of misunderstanding between them and she's able to see these family members who she thought she'd lost forever. So that was the first session in the consultation around the stories of change. The next session focused more on indicators. So we wanted to know what indicators or signs young people felt showed that a child is successfully reintegrated and out of these signs which were the most important. So why do we want to know this? Because we wanted young people to generate their own locally relevant indicators based on their experiences and knowledge of reintegration. And we felt that organisations could then potentially use these indicators in the monitoring and evaluation activities. 
So to do this, the next session started with children being asked to come up with their own understandings and definitions of reintegration. Following this, we then asked them to create a list of indicators by brainstorming all the different qualities, characteristics, behaviours, relationships, skills, knowledge that a young person would need to be successfully reintegrated. And once this was done, young people were asked to discuss amongst themselves and rank from one to ten the most important indicators. So here is an example of a definition that young people came up with in Albania. So they, they understood successful reintegration as having a safe house to live, living independently or with a family, having a job place and feeling happy and safe. And here's just a photo from one of the groups showing the free listing exercise. And you can see that in the middle is a smiley, happy, reintegrated child. And around them are all the different elements and attributes that young people felt that that child would need to be accepted and integrated. And you can see they've identified things like going to school, um, being hardworking, having food, having access to medical care, etc. And here are a couple of examples of the ranking exercises where children work to get together discussing all these different indicators and choosing the most important, placing that at one end of the line um, from one to ten. OK, so in terms of the findings, you can see here, um, there's three different tables I'm going to show you, uh, all the top five indicators that were chosen by the young people in the different groups. And you can see that it includes things like having self-esteem, acceptance, economic empowerment, love and respect, and also um, things like having a good relationship with family and community, having their basic needs fulfilled, ac having access to medical care, and then um, other things such as family and feeling safe, having documents and rights and having an, and living in a normal violence free life. So looking at all the indicators that young people came up with, there was many similar ones that came out. And so we themed those indicators and put them into the following seven categories. So the first category of indicators was around basic needs being met. So children talked a lot about how the shelters, uh, the, the organisations had provided shelter, food, water, medical care. Children also talked a lot about emotional support, so feeling safe, feeling loved, feeling cared for and supported. The third group was around kind of that, that internal strength, including things like having self-control, um, having faith, being confident, having um, a high opinion of oneself. And then behaviours around children respecting other people, and um, being hardworking, and um, being good, being kind. The next category was around education, so obviously children being in school, doing well in school, but also children accessing skills training when they weren't um, in formal education. The next category was around rights, and this came up quite a lot with young people saying that um, children needed to know their rights to be successfully reintegrated and also that the community and the family had to respect and upheld their rights because this was key to them being accepted and included. And then lastly, income and work for a lot of the young people um, was a key area. So young people talked about having a sustainable income, having a job um, so that they could provide for themselves and their families. So in terms of ranking, the basic needs met category and the emotional support category came in joint first position with 22% of children and young people ranking those in their top five indicators. And the category internal characteristics came next, with 17 children and young people ranking these types of indicators in their top five. And during the ranking session, young people were encouraged to think about and justify the reasons why one indicator was more important than the next. And so here are just a few comments from some of those categories um, that, that children discussed in those um, discussions around ranking. So here, um, the group in Serbia talk about a healthy man has a, mi a million wishes and a sick one only one. So the importance of health before anything else. The boys in Uganda talked about if you don't have enough food, it encourages stealing and that you can't be happy or healthy, you can't work or concentrate at school and you can't sleep well if you haven't got food. So therefore pointing out that the basic needs met was the most important aspect when it comes to these different indicators. 
So around emotional support, the boys in Ethiopia talked a lot about without having a caring and supporting family, um, that it's very difficult for children to stay safe and be protected, and this means that they'll go back on the street. So this emotional support was also something that they felt was really important. Similarly, the girls in Serbia talked about how important it was to have someone you can rely on who will support you and won't judge you, and someone that you can always go back to. And then in terms of internal characteristics, um, the girls in Uganda talked about, you know, when I'm confident I can do anything that I want, I'm able to do what other people don't expect me to do, achieve my goals, do anything without fear, enable and reach dreams, and helps you also to endure the toughest times. So talking about how that inner strength is so important in overcoming um, difficult times and doing better and moving on with, with one's life. And the younger girls in Kenya also talked about how important it was to respect yourself, even if life wasn't good, so that you can stand up to people, even if they say, say bad things about you. So lastly, after the indicators, we then wanted to learn um, about and, and gain feedback from the young people that took part in these activities. And we wanted to do that so we knew what children and young people thought of the activities, what they liked but also what staff felt, so the facilitation teams, how they felt about the activities and which activities provided useful and information that they could then learn and use in future programming. So children and young people were given different coloured sticky notes, stickers or pens, and they were asked to vote on all these different activities. So they were asked to put red down when they thought the activity went well, and vote green when they thought the activity Sorry, red when the activity didn't go well, green when the activity went well, and orange when they had suggestions for improvement. And from the results, it, it seemed that children and young people enjoyed ranking of indicators the most. And from the feedback, it seems that that was because it led to really lively discussions with the young people. Also, at this point in the session, they were all comfortable with each other, and also they were comfortable with the, the terminology and the concepts and what they were trying to do. The least popular activity was sharing stories of change. And this is because some children were quite shy um, in, in standing up and talking about, about these issues. And also, they found it difficult to express themselves. However, a lot of the young people really enjoyed the River of Life drawing um, and thought that, was, that worked really well. So there's just an example of some of the feedback from, from one of the groups. So we also asked the consultation team, so those were facilitating uh, the workshops, to answer a series of nine feedback questions once the consultation had finished. And on the screen, you can see one quote from a team um, who were involved. And they said that, it, it, that this was really complete feedback that they got from the beneficiaries, and that they usually get feedback through simple questionnaires or focus groups. But this consultation is the kind of feedback that they consider are most fruitful. And partner organisations in general did express that the consultation and those activities um, had a positive um, effect and were a positive learning experience. Partner organisations also reported that as a result of the consultations, they were going to change some specific aspects of their practice. So, for example, in one workshop, children spoke about how they were scared and frightened when they first came to the shelter because they didn't know what to expect. And they didn't know who these people were. So through these discussions, the, the partner organisation realised and has expressed that they'll now take more time to inform children more thoroughly about the care and what to expect when coming to the shelter. In another workshop, young women talked a lot about the problems and difficulties that they faced when they left the care of the partner organisation, particularly around using their skills and setting up small businesses and, and generating an income, because many of them didn't have the funds to start up their own businesses. So based on this feedback, the organisation has also committed to provide some startup funds for young people and to put in place a system of, of mentoring to help young people once they've completed their training and are no longer being supported by the organisation. So really positive changes there. And many organisations also expressed that they would be initiating more follow-up activities for children who have already been reintegrated back into homes, families and communities. And that's because they found out through these discussions that a lot of the young people missed their friends that they made at the centres. They missed the staff as well. Um, and they also found the, the activities really useful in identifying other support that children and young people who had already reintegrated may benefit from. 
and he also found it useful to learn from young people about their experiences since they'd left the, the kind of safety of the shelter home or organisation. Partner organisations also spoke about how they might incorporate the indicators into their existing monitoring and evaluation systems and that they would all use similar consultation activities in the future to listen to and engage more with their beneficiaries, which again is another real positive um, um, result from this process. So how have the findings from the consultation been incorporated into the toolkit? Well, the consultation led to the development and piloting of some new tools, and these tools will be included in the toolkit as real life examples for others to learn from. The stories of change also allowed us to identify all the different change domains, so the areas in the child's life where important changes occurred. And these areas we will then build in um, and try to monitor some of these changes in these areas. And the discussions around indicators and signs helped us to develop some general indicators that again we can use as examples in the toolkit. And of course the whole learning from organising these activities with children and young people will also be fed into into that resource. So in terms of learning and key points to take away, I think we learned as a group, everyone involved, how important and beneficial it can be to involve children and young people if you want to understand the very complicated path involved in reintegration. It also demonstrated how many young, how much young people have to share with us about their experiences and how much we can learn from them and improve our own practice. It showed how important it is to develop sensitive methods um, and be aware and prepared for ethical issues. For example, during the sessions, in a couple of cases, the need for more support was identified and the organisation were prepared for this and had those procedures in place to follow up with these young people and make sure that that support could be provided. And it also demonstrated the complex area of reintegration and that successful reintegration is not just about returning a child to their family, but there are many different dimensions to reintegration. So we need to get better at reporting on reintegration. So rather than just saying 23 children were reintegrated, we need to talk more about these dimensions in terms of social interactions, relationships, emotional support, um, in order to build up a good picture. Okay, and um, finally, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the children and young people who took part in the consultation all the partner organisations who facilitated the workshops and did a great job at doing that and reporting to us, and also to Helen Veach who prepared the guidelines, trained the teams and analysed the data, and lastly of course to the Oak Foundation for funding the consultation. And if you'd like to learn more about the consultation, then the report will be available soon on childrecovery.info, and the draft monitoring and evaluation toolkit should also be coming soonish to childrecovery.info um, and if you have any questions or any comments about the process then please do get in contact with my details are on the screen and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.